Good afternoon and assalamu alaikum ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to UNDP's uh, webinar entitled Pakistan's Climate Financing Landscape, Innovative Solutions for Climate Mitigation and Adaptation. As one of the 10 countries in the world most exposed to climate change, Pakistan's vulnerability to climate change and natural hazards affects all aspects of sustainable development. Pakistan has adopted the UNDP supported national climate change policy and the nationally determined contributions framework. Pakistan and its development partners, including the UN, have identified high financial adaptation investment needs at $7 billion to $14 billion per year to curb the impact of climate change and decarbonize the national economy. Meanwhile, the SDGs financing gap Pakistan faces in achieving the 2030 agenda, including goal 13 on climate action, is compounded by a drastic decline in official development assistance, which fell by 42.3% in absolute terms during 2015 to 2019, uh, from US dollars 3.7 billion to US dollars 2.1 billion. The IMF estimates the annual financing gap for SDGs that Pakistan needs stands at $3.7 billion for 2020 till 2030. And this comes at a time when Pakistan has narrowly escaped an economic crisis by finally reaching last month uh, a much needed agreement with the IMF to resume a $7 billion extended fund facility program which was suspended earlier this year. And in the new program, IMF expects Pakistan to protect its ongoing social protection and developing schemes. In this economically challenged country context, policymakers, development partners, and stakeholders need to make bold choices and unlock Pakistan's climate action through climate investments and innovative climate financing solutions for mitigation and adaptation. Today's webinar will discuss what some of these approaches and solutions could be. We're very fortunate and privileged to have a very distinguished panel of speakers to address uh, some of these aspects. Uh, we are joined by resident re representative of UNDP Pakistan, Mr. Kunut Osby. Uh, the Federal Minister for Climate Change, Senator Sherry Rahman, will join us shortly. We are also joined by a distinguished uh, panel of uh, uh, policy professionals uh, which include Mr. Harun Sharif, a former state minister, former Pakistan State Minister and Chairman Board of Investment, and UNDP's Senior Technical Advisor on Financing for Development, uh, Ms. Radhika Lal, who was UNDP's SDG Finance Policy Advisor at the UNDP Bangkok Regional Hub in the Asia Pacific Bureau, and Ms. Sobia Becker, who is Senior Climate Change Advisor and Team Lead at the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. I welcome all participants and I request UNDP Pakistan resident representative, Mr. Kunut Osby, uh, for his opening remarks, please. Over to you, Kunut. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so, respected panel members and uh, esteemed participants, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to welcome all of you to this international webinar on Pakistan's finance, climate financing landscape, innovative solutions for climate change mitigation and adaptation. I know that uh, the Federal Minister Sherry Rehman will join us shortly, and I want to, in advance, uh, express my thanks to the Federal Minister for taking a great interest in this subject and also for her valuable time to, to, uh, to join us today. I also want to thank uh, FCDO, uh, the government uh, officials, private sector, financial institutions, as well as the UDP's Regional Bureau for Asia Pacific for participation and keen interest both in this subject overall and for their interest in this webinar. I look very much forward to a constructive discussion today on the climate financing landscape, both from an international and from a local perspective. The global development financing sector is already at the crossroads and many developing countries, developing countries are struggling to raise the level of financing needed to tackle and adapt to climate change, which is now widespread, rapid and intensifying. In the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, already 10 finances have been stretched to the breaking point in, in many countries. Today, we aim to explore uh, some very important dimensions in how we can overcome this challenge 
uh, in the area of climate financing. Uh, we recall that on the World Environment Day last year, uh, there was an uh, initiative to launch a joint statement on uh, the first ever nature performance bond driven by the government uh, of Pakistan. This statement was made by the governments of UK, Canada, Germany, and UDP together. And in line with this commitment at UDP Pakistan, we are working towards sustainable solutions to deliver on Agenda 2030. Last year, we started working uh, more intensively on our financing for development portfolio in partnership with the government of Pakistan. Since then, we supported the government in developing Pakistan's first ever STD investment report in 2021. We presented a climate, uh, in, uh, and this report helped present a climate informed paradigm shift in economic growth pr uh, priorities and providing, uh, we're also working to provide technical support to develop Pakistan's first draft sustainability linked bond, uh, the Nature Performance Bond. Uh, we are also looking into other climate uh, finance dimensions, such as that for nature swaps and, and green so cooks to enable green recovery and accelerate nature capital restoration. Uh, this uh, this field has many dimensions, and I hope that the seminar today will help highlight some of those. And uh, there is much good work going on, and we're proud to be part of some of that. And uh, there's definitely a lot more work that needs to be done by all, all partners on this. I'm also pleased to inform that UDP Pakistan is setting up an SDG project development uh, facility supported by government development partners and the private sector. This facility has been tasked to further steer SDG aligned innovative financing in initiatives for a holistic institutional uh, policy framework and for future transactions, uh, working to develop good ideas into proposals that can be financed by private sector interests. Uh, globally, uh, UDP has launched the Climate Promise Initiative at the UN Climate Ambition Summit in uh, 2019 as a commitment to ensure that lack of funds or capacity would not be a barrier for any developing country that wish to, to prepare a more ambitious national climate pledge or nationally determined contributions. Um, in continuation of all this work, Today's webinar is particularly significant as we will be discussing the climate financing landscape in Pakistan based on insights and lessons learned globally. And uh, as I said, there are many dimensions to this work and we look forward to working with you and others to take this forward. I thank you once again for your gracious presence today and for your commitment towards climate action to fulfill the promise of Agenda 2030 in Pakistan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Konot, for setting uh, an, an important uh, uh, global and national context for uh, climate financing in Pakistan. Uh, Mr. Konot Osby, resident representative of UNDP Pakistan, uh, brings uh, uh, valuable experience in development, human rights, and humanitarian affairs across 17 countries, uh, including Pakistan, Myanmar, Timor Leste, Fiji, and uh, Iran. Uh, as resident representative UNDP, as well as as the United Nations resident coordinator and humanitarian coordinator. Uh, I understand uh, that we are trying to connect the Honorable Minister, and I am looking for a guidance from her team, uh, whether the minister may be uh, connected and ready, uh, because we would now uh, turn to the Honorable Minister's keynote address. Her team thinks they're connected. Um, if they can try speaking, we do see you here. Uh, I hope that uh, I don't see the minister's screen. screen. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we apologize. Uh, also at UNDP, we are huh? facing... Okay. Hello. Amara, can you hear me? 
Uh, madam, I can hear Hello? you, but we cannot see you. We can hear you, but we cannot see you. Hello? Internet is dicey for all of us uh, also here at UNDP. So please bear with us. Uh, this is, uh, we, we haven't completely arrived digitally yet. I hope other participants can uh, hear. not working but it can't be like this that i can't hear them uh, madam uh your voice is disrupted and there is no visual it's not from there sir can you hear me now no she can't hear. Gee, uh, we, can, we can hear you madam You want to do it on the phone? I'm, this is not working because their we, internet is not. We, where, 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 we can hear you, but we cannot see you. Okay. Can you hear me, but you can't see me? G, we can hear you uh, loud and clear, madam, but the visual is not there. No, no, it's on, fully on. I can Let see me, I can see him. So why is this happening? I, uh, um, Amara, I just spoke to the senator's team. The minister's team, they're suggesting if we could just give them 10 minutes and carry on and then um, when she's sure. all set up and can. Uh, sure, we, okay. we can do that uh, with Knut's permission. Uh, we can start with the, our other speakers. Mm -hmm. The minister's office is trying to set her up and uh, she will join us as soon as this is logistically possible uh, for her to connect. Uh, let me start okay. the panel discussion with our distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, Harun Saab, my first question is for you. Uh, Pakistan's current efforts for resource mobilization, and that includes uh, borrowing, multilateral and bilateral. In your assessment, uh, is it aligned with SDGs investments and how much scope does it have for climate financing and investments? Gee, thank you very much, Amara. First of all, thanks to UNDP for organizing uh, this very timely and useful discussion. Uh, my very focused answer is that we cannot detach Pakistan's financing needs from what's happening globally. So what we are seeing is that the global growth is shrinking, interest rates are going up, uh, the countries are getting into more and more debt servicing pressure because interest rates are going up, money supply is shrinking. So uh, interestingly, the situation in the developed world and the developing world is pretty much identical. Everybody's facing inflation. So with this background, what I see is that the already stressed uh, uh, development financing kitty in Pakistan uh, is likely to further shrink because as you said in your introduction, that governments will be more keen in a slowdown period to look towards cash transfers towards the marginalized and others. So what this will do is, uh, I think majority of the participants have seen our budgetary allocations, uh, where you know more than 55% goes for debt servicing and remaining for running the state and the tax collection uh, is way below uh, our spend. So in this background, it actually creates a huge challenge uh, that how do you finance SDGs? 
how do you finance you know climate resilience initiatives and that is where i have been consistently with your help <clears throat> advocating that we need to diversify the sources uh, we need to come up with instruments which are acceptable to market players and we need to look at multiple sources to fund it rather than banking on two traditional uh, uh, you know sources which is taxpayers money and multilateral financing. So this is the time, uh, uh, and in the course of discussion, uh, I would have you know very practical suggestions that how countries in Pakistan should do that. Thank you, uh, Haroon. We're still waiting for the minister's team to connect her uh, to this session. And in the meantime, let me turn to. Uh, Sobia Becker, who is Senior Climate Change Advisor uh, and Team Lead at, at the SCDO. Uh, uh, and Sobia, you have also worked very closely with the UNDP Pakistan team on uh, climate financing and climate change related issues. Sobia, why do you think, you know, first and foremost, I think a lot of our participants would try to understand, would want to understand what do we mean by climate financing and why do you think it is important especially for a country like Pakistan. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Assalamu alaikum and a very good afternoon. It's a pleasure indeed to be joined uh, uh, esteemed uh, panel for this very important umbrella term. And it relates to all those development financial flows that are made available to countries by providers to finance climate action. And this is a, a critical discussion that we're having right now, especially in the backdrop of the post-pandemic recovery. Um, and I'd like to also um, really, I welcome Harun's comments on the, on the current situation. So in addition to some of the challenges that Harun already pointed out, um, I think that one of the biggest challenges to attract climate finance and to scale up climate finance uh, is, of course, and that for me is like the, the elephant in the room, is the financing gap that we have. And this financing gap exists not only in reaching the goals of Agenda 2030, but also to reach Paris goals. So the world currently needs about $4.5 trillion to reach the SDG and global needs for meeting the Paris goals around $7 trillion per year. Um, and this is a pre-pandemic uh, estimate. So you can imagine that this figure has gone up since then. What is very clear is that we cannot drive climate action without finance. And this is why finance was a key goal for COP26 and it remains a priority for the UK's presidency year going into COP27. I think that one of the things that I would like to add um, to the valuable uh, remarks that um, my uh, colleague just made, that um, what is missing in the climate finance narrative in this country is the role of private sector finance. At this time, the volume of assets under management in the private sector are close to $500 trillion. And we need just a fraction of that to deliver not only Paris commitments, but also the SDGs. So international public finance alone will never be enough to achieve the trillions needed for investments to mitigate and adapt to a rapidly changing climate. The involvement of the private sector will be key. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Sobia. Very pertinent uh, points, and I think we are going to have uh, some more discussion on, especially the private role of the private sector that you've highlighted in a bit. I'm informed that the Honorable Minister is ready to uh, join us. Uh, is that correct? Can you see me? Yes. Yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, let me formally let me formally uh, welcome Honorable Federal Minister for Climate Change, Senator Sherry Rahman, 
We, we are very privileged to have her today. Um, Senator Rahman is a fourth term Pakistan parliamentarian, a diplomat, a journalist, a civil society activist who has received Pakistan's highest civil award, Nishan Imtiaz. Uh, prior to her current uh, portfolio, she has also served as Pakistan's ambassador to the United States of America and Federal Minister for Information and Broadcasting. She is the founding chair and president of the Jinnah Institute of Pakistan, Madam Minister, very welcome. And we request you for your keynote remarks, please. Thank you very much, uh, Amara. And uh, thank you uh, to UNDP and uh, Knoto Osby also for uh, convening this important platform. Uh, I wish we were speaking uh, in non-virtual space because that's what we've gotten used to. But um, I think it's uh, crucial to address climate financing at a time when uh, the whole world is reeling from missed goals and uh, targets that are not really being met in terms of uh, bargains being made at the conference of parties uh, that we've been holding our climate goals uh, to and we've been holding each other's feet to the fire. My uh, first issue is, look, Pakistan is... Uh, is actually right now reeling from severe capacity gaps in uh, addressing all aspects of mitigation and adaptation financing. What we have been doing so far is addressing uh, broad mitigation needs only in afforestation because nature-based solutions are sometimes the most cost-effective and you know easiest to implement in a country where climate literacy and literacy otherwise is low, uh, which has been largely financed by the public sector of Pakistan's very cash-strapped uh, PSDP and the provincial uh, uh, programs. So the provinces have gone 50% and the, the federal government has gone 50% uh, on this expenditure. But that currently is only the real big thrust um, ongoing in which the, perform, uh, the, the, the provinces have performed quite well. But uh, the issue really is the we have committed to very high mitigation goals, if I may say so. And, and, and they're very important for a society which is impacted by uh, climate change the way we are. Now, we literally are having this conversation in the backdrop of a monsoon emergency that we've declared on August 5th. And we'll be having our 75th anniversary, uh, literally at the ground zero of climate catastrophe, as 2022 has shown us heat waves, um, uh, forest fires, where we've lost a lot of our natural capital, especially in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and Balochistan and uh, many uh, such calamities. And right now we're in the middle of uh, bracing for a fresh torrential monsoon wave, which brings urban flooding. And of course, uh, our, our rivers are now flooding areas like Balochistan. In all of this, the vulnerable are the, uh, are, you know, suffering the most. And we are mostly, in the last three months, we've been literally fighting fires without the requisite money or the calamity funds, the disaster funds to actually uh, go further. I've, I've been on the field myself in Sindh and other teams have been busy in Balochistan and KP. Now, how does this match up with a broader policy uh, ambition? As I was saying, well, here's the thing. Uh, states like Pakistan with very little uh, ideas uh, or institutional capacity or even policy buy-in beyond a point to climate goals have had a struggle with even understanding that they need, that we need to focus given our needs and given the, the crisis, the level of crisis we face, to, uh, we need to focus on adaptation. We don't have an adaptation national plan right now which, which I think we urgently need. We don't even have a coherent, publicly articulated adaptation policy. It's all part of a larger uh, thrust which has favored mitigation. We've made commitments such as, you know, moratorium on new coal power, you know, power plants, which we have put in from 2020. Uh, and we have said that we will transition to renewable energy by 2030 
which is at least 50% of renewable, renewable energy, and of course, shift to 60% renewables uh, by 2030. Now, this kind of ambition is matched in very few, by very few developing countries. Uh, many have not even come this far. So it's, it's valuable to make that pledge for ourselves because, as I said, we're in the front lines of a, of a multiple cascading climate emergency. And I think that's not been understood. These are not just weather events. They are climate-induced changes and stresses that our society is facing, which means that if there is a, a limited bag of, uh, of climate finance to be delivered, uh, across the board in Pakistan, priorities have to be set on what uh, on what will get uh, uh, the, that financial delivery first. And understanding and institutional capacity has to be created for not just private markets, which are obviously the new thing, uh, since we've seen that uh, a very large, broad failures on uh, uh, public sector climate finance have become very real. They are clear to us that most of the commitments made at the conference of parties and the bargain struck on loss and damage between the global south and the, the global north have just not worked out. I'll just tell you what Pakistan has been getting in terms of accessing international climate finance and that literally includes one adaptation fund and five projects from the Green Climate Fund. All of these total $134 million facility and plus uh, 19, I think 19.4 million from the Jeff facility, right? On the total, we have, I think we've been given $153.5 million only. Now, just to put in perspective, our uh, adaptation and mitigation needs every year will range from anything from 7 uh, billion per annum to 14 billion per annum. This is a calculus that is made uh, as reflected in our NDCs until 2050. Now, 2050 is a very far goal. It's a remote future given the ferocity and scale of climate change. So honestly, in my view, if anybody is even looking at climate change trajectories, 2030 is the decisive decade. This is when the worm will turn or not. This is when the needle will shift. For that, uh, it's very clear that uh, public sector finance is not ready or available. Secondly, it is also very clear that all the pledges made at international financial forums uh, are not anywhere close to the goals they have set themselves, meaning there is a big gap between ambition and action. So, because these are global problems, if if one country alone is, 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 is doing what it needs to, like Costa Rica or Colombia, very good. But our lives will not change. Uh, our, our biodiversity will not be protected if we don't do this together. Now, coming back from the together to, to, you know, zooming back into Pakistan, at, at the COP level, uh, and because I'm, I'm, I'm your federal minister, I can't just insist on saying, all right, the commitments made to, to Pakistan are not, uh, the, the public sector ones won't matter. No, they do. Uh, and uh, we will be bringing up loss and damage as a very serious core principle, including a, seeking a focus on adaptation at the next COP. We are also chair of uh, the group of seven. Uh, uh, countries and we will be this will be as, well as, the capabilities, as well as a full need based approach. Now, all of these approaches have not been prioritized, they've not been headlined, and we are sitting with a promise of a hundred billion dollars in the global climate fund at the state level and at the public level, and that has never happened, as we all know. 
So while countries are moving away from coal at the first or, or, or while we're still reeling from worrying about whether there's a carbon footprint from the Ukraine war, because clearly there is, the carbon footprint of war is huge. Uh, so I'm a little impatient with lectures about how we must shift uh, uh, with hectoring about commitments made because really our commitments were based on the ability to finance these, which brings us back to the losses we face. Now that's 9.1% of GDP, uh, which is literally the highest in, in South Asia and the Asia Pacific region. And I'm sure it's the world uh, because we, we exceed many African countries in the losses, and this is estimated by USS Gap, and in the losses estimated by climate change. Now, if climate change is re wreaking this level of havoc in, in South Asia, what are we doing about it? Very simply, Pakistan has tried to leverage traditional institutional forums. One is, of course, the Jeff and the Climate Fund. And of course, they're right there. And I've spoken about what they have uh, been able to uh, operationalize for Pakistan. Uh, and we appreciate that very, very much. UNDP is one of the, uh, uh, you know, actors on the ground with us uh, in, in adaptation needs and GLOF projects, etc. But actually a fantastic gap, which it's hard to fathom and for pricing carbon, nor are able to understand how that goes into decarbonization goals. Uh, this is a big leap to make. The private financing networks are huge. Obviously, the capital that can be leveraged is quite high. But we, and we are of course told that uh, the carbon trade, voluntary markets, compliance markets are the place to go. Now, and of course, blended finance, etc. In 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 the blended finance uh, sector, we've been looking at obviously we've been looking at the bond market, and Pakistan has floated one green bond. There wasn't much enthusiasm because it went straight into uh, budget support, uh, but there is a bandwidth for blue bonds for nature performance bonds. Now, performance bonds don't always uh, you know align themselves. To the vulnerabilities on the ground in in that uh, the multiple indicators or or checks needed to perform to to keep that money flowing or not fall further into debt uh, are not uh, very available and accessible to developing countries so, so what i would like to avoid is further debt and and the bond markets often take you there for countries that have, have just come out of COVID ourselves, the whole world has, we've not seen any special drawing rights or anything for Pakistan, whereas really the world should be thinking about special drawing rights for just the climate fund to be mobilized for developing countries, given how uh, we are impacted and the choices, the Faustian choices uh, many countries are having to make. I mean, Germany has just gone back to coal. I just saw a uh, a PowerPoint where um, parts of the United States are going back to, are not keeping uh, their coal shutdown goals. Having said that, we are, because, uh, you know, you can't keep on saying, well, there's a fire in your house and let's talk about who's, let's prevaricate on who's, who's going to put it out. We still have to put out the fire. Again, uh, the fires are not created by Pakistan. There is a acute consciousness of this, and there's an acute consciousness of the fact that we are the we are the other one percent, right? We are the other one percent, the less than one percent who don't contribute to the global uh, emissions registry. I mean, our emissions are less than one percent, so we're the other uh, vulnerable one percent, as opposed to the 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 one percent that Oxfam likes to talk about the rich people in the world the richest of the rich we are the most vulnerable and the poorest of the poor right now now people may not like to hear that but that is where we are so naturally countries ask us ask each other and and policy makers ask but we're not uh, we're not adding to the emissions pool 
and, and we're being asked to do make all these transitions, these expensive transitions. Minister, have you even had a calculation done on how much the transitions cost? 101 billion just to make the renewable energy transition without transmission costs without transmission costs, $101 billion. Now you tell me how that's possible with current public financing pools available. It's not. Adding on debt through the private sector, but I think perhaps that will have to be one of the ways to go. Obviously, carbon markets are, are the attraction here and, and our our provinces with high high kind of forestry goals are doing well and want to go there. Sen obviously has to do that. It's it's uh, it's passed many um, goal posts in its mangroves project. Khyber Pakhtunkhwa has uh, has forests it wants to trade its carbon for, uh, and uh, we don't have carbon trade frameworks that will at this point ensure a. Uh, uh, clear unified framework that is transparent and compatible across all our, our region now carbon pricing itself internationally is a very is still at a very fragile and and a frankly strange stage because even in the united states you see two states pricing their carbon differently from each other there is no uniform there is no one price at which carbon trades or, or set of, of, of prices or of slabs at which it trades given, a, you know, given its universality and given its uh, quality. So debt for decarbonization, debt for nature swaps, they sound good. We may still have to go into the, them, but it piles on the debt for countries. If you're looking at aligning your current adaptation needs, to long-term investments in resilience and some level of sustainability. Now, what does Pakistan need to do? We need to, first of all, create a national climate change fund. We don't have one so that all public and private finance, instruments of grant, loan, equity, insurance, all of that, other repositories, guarantees, and other instruments can function uh, transparently and compatibly and sustainably in this space. And this fund should also technically work as a repository uh, for or, or kind of registry, which we need a nature registry, we need a climate registry, we need a uh, where all the financial data is, is uh, exchangeable and available, building an uh, arm. And we've been speaking to uh, the UK, for instance, which had. Uh, spoken to us about committing some funds to building such a registry. And you have to have really deep pockets to create a clear carbon, uh, um, a clear carbon footprint detail. Uh, so having said that, we are still in conversations with the private sector because we are working towards net zero goals. And as they come to us one by one, aligning their, their goals to the caps that we set them, for instance, the textile industries, the most uh, pressed at this point uh, in conversations with me on, on this subject. As we consider uh, uh, the, the, the steps they take to decarbonize, we ask ourselves, right, what are the rebates we get? What offsets do we get? And the carbon offset market still isn't clear if it's not one big greenwash. Right? I am selling you my good practices, my carbon sink, and I still will have to. I think that may be one of the only way of leveraging clean finance uh, for, for um, uh, polluters to, to greenwash their lack of uh, sustainability or to greenwash their uh, pollution. They're buying our credits to offset theirs. You know how this works. But at its heart is still a gross inequity. We are selling our good practices, whereas we should be compensated for our good practices, our best practices, without having to hear that another country or another entity is using it to offset its bad habits. Because that's what it's doing, isn't it? And if it's not, I'm simplifying this whole thing. 
if it's not then correct me if i'm wrong because very often that's the the gray area where we are working ultimately you know the 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 carbon rich lifestyles that we have le- that we have lived are still going to be bought by the offsets we sell perhaps by the aviation industry perhaps by many others that find it very difficult to adapt at this point given uh, the world's the way markets work and so and the world develops so i think we need to identify we will have to set up carbon uh, trade mechanisms we still need a carbon a climate financing unit we are setting up one as we speak at the ministry there wasn't one uh, and i am advocating for the national climate change fund so such repositories can be built and also a carbon trade framework which should be universal across all universal across all and consistent across all provinces and our three federating units so the federation should then be able to speak with one viable financial as one viable financial entity across the board for trade for buying for offsetting uh, and actually earning uh, the the money it needs because we have a large uh, we have large carbon sinks and uh, pakistan is very cash strapped so even to align um, our our with our our own goals our adaptation goals let alone mitigation pakistan needs a lot of uh, disaster risk mitigation and uh, disaster risk development uh, and management and reduction money it doesn't have that right now even for the current monsoon uh, disaster we had to declare an emergency and we are hoping un ocha and other agencies step in uh, we have been called it an international appeal it's not 2010 when one fifth of pakistan was under water but it's a uh, signaling severe and uh, unmitigated at this point trauma and stress on the ground brought on by climate stress so uh, you know our need is very clear we'll be water scarce by 2025 we are fed almost entirely by glacial melt our river systems and uh, our glaciers also melting very fast and and UNDP should know this better than anyone else because uh, you're involved with us in supporting the uh, glacial lake outburst flood mechanisms so having said all that it's still not clear to us how how we can have enhance and leverage uh, green finance private finance um more responsibly and more tra- transparently that is the need and and obviously consistently so yes private and and all sorts of uh, financial uh, systems at this point because uh, that is a need on the ground and in 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 assessing those needs we are quite behind uh, many countries in south asia don't even understand that they have a clear and present and danger in the shape of excess accelerated climate change okay not 2050 where we set our markers to and it will be very important for us to leverage all levels of finance and and much of it may burden us with debt but we will still have to do it just to meet current adaptation goals which i am busy setting right now because they haven't been set so that's really where we Yeah, a great deal of policy and finance work uh, and, and and muscle is needed, and uh, we really appreciate your uh, putting on a thinking cap. Technicalities, I may not be, um, you know, uh, a policy. Uh, there may there may be policy thinking that that you uh, are, cannot open your door on or face barriers on. which i should be able to help with but the point here is we need the best instruments that can leverage climate finance fast with a without creating debt or too much opacity uh, and burdening us you know future 
uh, uh, low targets on carbon, I mean, decarbonization, and hearing that we have sold our, uh, our, our, our Uh, we've lost uh, the minister because of disruption in the connection. Minister, can you can you still hear us? We'll wait for the minister uh, to be reconnected uh, before we resume our discussion. All right, I think uh, uh we we are facing disruption and uh, we can possibly resume our discussion and the minister may join us uh, but let me turn to our panelists uh while we wait for the minister uh but of course uh the minister has really set a very dynamic country con uh, country context and policy. I mean, this is a policy speech for all practical purposes. Harun, Sobia, Radhika, I think you will agree with me uh, that the minister has really set up a dynamic clarion call for Pakistan. This is a policy speech. She's, she's went into great detail with solid numbers on what the challenges and what the needs are. Before I come to Harun and Sobia on the Pakistani context, Radhika, I'd like to turn to you. You've heard the Pakistan federal minister just now, who's gone into incredible level of detail as to what the challenge is. And you uh, are working with other countries in the neighborhood of Pakistan in the Asia Pacific region. Um, and I'm curious to know, you know, how much of, of uh, the government of Pakistan represented here today by the minister, how much of this perspective and this clarion call resonates with other countries in the region? What is UNDP's experience uh, with other countries, um, specifically when it comes to climate financing? Radhika, over to you. Thanks very much, uh, Amara, and a big thank you to UNDP for organizing this very forward-looking panel and for the invitation. Um, a very difficult ask, Amara, because of the scale of the, of the challenge, right? Um, Asia Pacific and Pakistan in particular, really on the front lines of vulnerability, uh, not having contributed um, to the emissions uh, historically, but now facing the, the, the implications of that. Um, and so it's really quite challenging when you say, you know, um, does it resonate? Absolutely. Um, and I think that's something that we are hearing from many countries is really um, how do they work with limited budgets um, to deal with an issue which, you know, which is beyond their control in many, many instances. And I think one thing that we should just recognize completely off the bat, that it's domestically mobilized resources for the most part. Uh, that contribute the major source of funding for, for climate finance. Um, it's not um, from the, the, the vertical funds or other things. It may be quite important for specific countries, but on the whole for developing countries, it's really funds that they mobilize at the national level through the budget and through um, development finance institutions that really forms the majority of, of climate finance. So countries are leading in this. Similarly, with tax and other things, even in low income countries, that often far exceeds what they get in terms of ODA. And increasingly, overseas uh, development assistance is more in the nature of loans and increasingly non concessional finance rather than grants. So the grants come really, um, you know, for the public goods type investments, really come from countries on. Uh, own finances and finances that they mobilize uh, from financial institutions regionally, nationally, and internationally. 
So that's, I think, the, the first thing. The developed countries are nowhere near the target that they had agreed to uh, some time ago, the 100 billion, and even that was nowhere near enough. So I think we should just uh, be clear on that set of issues. Uh, what's worked um, is one, I think we need an all hands on deck, all instruments, all, all partners, I think, as the minister also, also said. Uh, there's, you know, the money will come from all of those different sources, but doing things differently. Uh, and that's perhaps where I would begin, um, especially with regard to adaptation. We, we could just off the bat recognize that adaptation finance is really development finance. Um, even in terms of official, you know, categories of climate finance, it forms 10%. Uh, of the total. And while there is move now to address those inequities um, and misallocations and increase the amount of um, adaptation finance, again, it is very, very limited. So it's again what countries use their own resources for, um, which is going to be quite, quite important. And I think we should also recognize that Pakistan has made quite a lot of, uh, and it is on the front lines of of looking at how to channel its, its budgets uh, differently through work that's been done, um, tracking where the resources are going and you know, using that as an entry point to inform decision-making. Um, other countries have also looked at a mix of, of debt finance as, but as the minister said, you know, that's something quite difficult to look at. So if you, uh, but if you take the example of, uh, of Malaysia, of uh, Indonesia, others, which have really tapped into green sukuks, others, um, and other instruments to really channel uh, resources to, in, in their instance, I think five or nine specific industries, um, and also setting the stage for looking at the impact in the use of that, those funds, uh, reaching uh, a more diversified pool of investors, uh, which is actually quite important. But one of the things that I would say is, to be honest, there are no magic bullets. Um, even with the debt furniture swaps, and we take the most successful one to date, which would be the example of Belize, which has been also highlighted in your advocacy note, which was for over $500 million. Um, and interestingly, with really um, purchasing debt at a discount, um, and a third party reissuing a bonds, um, you know, with a much longer tenor and with much more favorable terms, but really doing this with private investors, this was quite significant. It was the nature conservancy which was involved and not any uh, creditors giving, a, you know, providing some kind of uh, discount uh, on their part. Uh, but this is, you know, far between the IMF, the World Bank, and others have looked at the issue of swaps. Uh, I think if we all do a Google search, we'll find around the time of the COP, you know, there was all kinds of indications that they might come out with, you know, with a, a position on that. But we know that these things are extraordinarily difficult um, and involve multiple players. And so it hasn't really moved. Um, you know, beyond the common framework coming out of the, uh, the G20, you know, it's still very much uh, work in progress. What are some of the things that one could do differently? Um, one is to look at some of the green shoots that are already there and accelerate them. Um, there are now discussions going on in Sri Lanka, for example, around e-tuk-tuks or two and three wheelers. Um, in neighboring countries looking at um, technologies such as uh, battery swapping, which actually I was very pleased were also looked at in terms of UNDP's uh, policy brief on e-mobility, uh, where you've looked at all these different options, you know, for Pakistan and also looked at the, the possibilities there. Um, and with firms already there, is really accelerating those types of investments with battery swapping. You don't need to make um, investments in charging, they, you know, especially for, for uh, two and three wheelers, much, much easier, the technology from China. And I often wonder why we don't have debt for energy swaps, you know, particularly in the, the context of the Ukraine war, when prices went through the roof, you know, when that would have been the need of the hour, you know, uh, to really get some kind of relief because simply raising prices 
you know, doesn't provide up, um, many alternatives for people on the ground. I mean, what are they supposed to do? Uh, all quite well for, you know, for rich people to tone down their consumption, you know, which they can. But what do you do with, um, with people who have to, have to be mobile? So I think accelerating those investments, perhaps even looking at equity um, and joint ventures, other things to really scale that up. Uh, that's something that, again, we're seeing it's now becoming almost fashionable in some countries, you know, to have an EV um, and to go in that direction. Some countries are also looking at um, getting all government vehicles to be, for example, to be EV, right? Having those kind of doing leasing arrangements with firms which simply provide the car, the driver and, you know, make sure it's charged. So a lot of things that could be done to really through government's procurement, let's put it that way, to be more green, more sustainable, but market creating, you know, agree on standards, agree on the on the technologies, but then really accelerate. And that brings in its own set of investments. But this is one. Uh, decentralized energy is another. Uh, all kind of business models, pay as you go, other things to really increase access to to clean energy beyond taking care of the circular debt and, and things that government needs to do and for which there is support from ADB, the World Bank and others. Um, also thinking about cash plus when it comes to providing support to vulnerable groups. Um, South Africa for a very long time has had a range of um, social protection programs that encompass both the social sectors, but also the environment sectors. So you have a working on fire program that looks at doing preventative measures to, redu to reduce um, wildfires. You have a working on water program that looks at invasive species, but also a variety of conservation measures. So this is perhaps you know, where there could be much uh, increased investment with core benefits. You're looking at social protection, but you're also addressing some of these types of adaptation goals and, you know, in the lead up to the monsoon and other things, these kind of investments could help to mitigate uh, damage. Um, and then we could go into a variety of others, but again, I would say no magic bullet, uh, figure out how to accelerate the green shoots, the types of investments that need to be made. Um, and then that attracts different types of investor interest. You know, it's not just what does government do with its money. It's what does government do to set the direction of the way that it wants to go, which then attracts other types of uh, um, investments. But let me stop there. Thank you, Radhika, for the, this excellent, I think, uh, lots of uh, fantastic experiences uh, and uh, uh, examples you've given us, and especially the one from South Africa, where you refer to South Africa's social protection program fully aligned with the climate change needs. And of course, in Pakistan, we have a long history of social protection program. The current one, the Benazir Income Support Program, is a bipartisan uh, program continued across uh, change of uh, governments and I think lots of potential there to align it with, with the climate change. I want to come to Sobia Becker uh, for a key question. Uh, you know, the minister in her fantastic speech referred to very clearly the global inequity in the climate change grid. Uh, Pakistan amongst being the 1% uh, uh, and bearing the brunt of it all. Uh, and, uh, you know, FCDO, so we are with you included in the team, is working very closely with government development partners. You've looked at nature performance bonds yourself and other instruments. You know, how, how can Pakistan uh, and the international community uh, resolve this question or issue of inequity? And the minister is very clear, Pakistan simply cannot afford any more debt or instruments or solutions which take uh, Pakistan towards the debt issue. Your thoughts, Sobia? Thank you very much. And uh, it's, uh, Madam Minister was as eloquent as ever, and it was indeed a pleasure to listen to her speak. And a lot of what Radhika was also saying resonated with me quite a bit. Um, there are a couple of things that I'd like to unpack here, Amada. Uh, the first thing that we have to understand is climate change is a problem of uh, what is called uh, the global commons. So it is joint action that precipitates it, and it is also joint action 
that can address it. And therefore, it's very difficult to isolate the one or the other country to say, well, we did it and we're not going to do it. Um, and that's uh, important to remember. And actually, this whole idea, this systems thinking view of, uh, of a global common good is also what drives the Paris Agreement forward. So that's the one thing. The second thing is that, unfortunately, because of Pakistan's geography and topography, climate change impacts are, are exacerbated. Um, this also has to be seen. So it is a function of that as well. Um, then the third thing is that I think that um, while adaptation is important because we're seeing the type of direct impacts, but mitigation is equally important. And there, uh, if mitigation isn't addressed at the right time in the right way, the adaptation efforts will not be able to keep pace with the type of negative impacts that the country will see. Having said that, if I were to unpack some of the minister's comments, very clearly, she's talking about five challenges. Um, she quoted, uh, again, uh, important data that Pakistan has had a disbursement, one disbursement from the adaptation funds, five disbursements from uh, the GCF and the GEF, which are actually the vehicles uh, established by the Paris Agreement. But this, again, can be changed because the, the challenges that she referred to in her speech are, one, it's about country ownership. It's the problem, it's owning it, it's deciding how you're going to address it. Then a certain degree of responsiveness, which is addressed to um, country needs and country priorities. And then aligning all of this with development plans, identifying where the bottlenecks are and how, and how these bottlenecks as well as information gaps are going to be addressed. And then does the system have enough flexibility as well as innovation? So how agile can Pakistan be in accessing not just traditional avenues for, uh, for uh, climate and sustainable finance? It's important to make that, um, um, that differentiation. Um, and then finally, transparency and accountability. So let me start with transparency and accountability first. And here I'd like to also mention um, the great work the UNDP was doing, supported by the, um, by the FCDO on the, uh, the CPEIR, uh, the Climate Public Expenditure and, in, uh, and Institutional Review, which was one of the first tools that gave a very clear indication about what the climate inflows were, what the outflows were, where they were being used. And this is exactly the type of transparency that we need under different articles of the Paris Agreement, which will improve Pakistan's ability to draw down climate finance. Now, when we talk about the National Adaptation Plan as the primary mechanism for accessing the adaptation funds, this has been a couple of years in, in the making. So, you know, this is the type of also agility we need in the system uh, to be able to access all of the all of the mechanisms that have been made available. And this is this is important to understand. Um, I'm always slightly nervous about debt for nature swaps because they can send uh, an unwanted signal to international capital markets. But as far as we talk about what the different mechanisms for um, attracting climate finance, they're already in place. So the challenges that I mentioned right now, the five challenges, are the same set of challenges from the recipient side, so countries like Pakistan, and they're also the same challenges that the providers of climate finance face. So it's very important to be looking at all of these uh, at these challenges. The sixth challenge, obviously, is the innovation in the financial ecosystem we need to access other sources of finance. And we spoke about that in the opening remarks, so I won't uh, uh, deliberate upon those again. So the mechanisms for climate finance are in place. And as a, a signatory to the Paris Agreement, Pakistan is obliged even to implement and report against these mechanisms. Now, this reporting will strengthen Pakistan's ability to draw down 
climate finance, and these mechanisms are obviously the nationally determined contributions. It's the GCF, it's the GEF, and it is the National Adaptation Plan. And all of these mechanisms are at the heart of national lead and national priority. So um, very pleased to hear about the climate finance unit coming up, uh, et cetera. We definitely need to have a whole of government approach to addressing climate change. And this uh, part of this approach, rather a central pillar of this approach should be the government of Pakistan clearly articulating climate action priorities on robust climate models, scientific and economic information, which is missing. This will also facilitate decision making uh, at all levels of government, as well as amongst development partners, and then associating that with sectoral policies, um, etc. So um, just to also mention that these challenges to accessing climate finance are well understood. And in March of last year, the UK um, COP co-presidency launched the task force on access to climate finance. And this was at the Climate and Development Ministerial. So this task force responds to calls for streamlining access to climate finance by building on established commitments on finance, the SDGs, as well as aid effectiveness. And we do look forward to Pakistan's uh, participation at the next climate and development ministerial because it's important for Pakistan's voice to be also heard. So we do hope that they will make it. So the minister also mentioned the work with uh, the private sector. And as you know, uh, the um, British High Commission in the run up to COP26 has worked very closely with private industry to reduce their carbon footprint. So in the absence of a public sector net zero commitment, we have deployed uh, a bottom up private uh, sector approach to reaching net zero. And the, the mechanisms for understanding that, how you're going to measure that, how this can be linked up to the NDC so that we're all serving one purpose these are in place and we look forward to supporting the, gov uh, the government of Pakistan on all of these issues. I'll pause there, Amara. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sobia. Uh, you know, uh, you uh, the minister was very candid in, in pointing out the uh, aspects around the global inequity on climate change. And you have also provided a very robust, detailed, extrapolated response as to how bilateral donors like FCDO look at the prism, you know, having your own expectations from, from Pakistan on agility, on, on transparency and, uh, you know, UNDP, I can myself, or you and I have worked so closely on this aspect and we take a lot of heart from FCDO's very proactive approach, very detailed, very committed approach, very, and we are encouraged to hear from the minister and from you that FCDO stands committed to providing you know, support, capacity building and other aspects for building Pakistan's capacity to address these issues. Um, I, I want to uh, pick up on Radhika's point on uh, market creative solutions, Harun Saab, and I want to come to you now. Uh, in On July 31st, uh, the Ministry of Finance and the State Bank of Pakistan issued a joint policy statement uh, on Pakistan's strategy for navigating fiscal year 2023, five important facts. And this stemmed from, you know, the ongoing national uh, uh, debate on IMF and, and, and default and et cetera. And that's a very detailed uh, uh, fact sheet. And one of the points that the fact sheet referred to Pakistan's, um, you know, experimentation with green bonds, uh, to which the minister also uh, referred to in her speech, um, and how ultimately the fiscal challenge and the debt distress that Pakistan is uh, acutely uh, suffering from, uh, ultimately how it kind of negatively impact the dividends that the green bonds uh, have or may have brought for Pakistan. Now, that raises the question mark. If we are to look at financial instruments like bonds, green, blue bonds, but if the, there is a larger country economic context that we are all aware of, you know, what could be some of the 
uh, preventive measures to ensure that the financial instruments uh, that Pakistan tables for climate financing, bonds included, how, how can we protect uh, our, our the climate financing interventions uh, from this larger economic context? And how, uh, I mean, what to speak of turning the tables, but how can we protect the interventions? And, you know, in addition to government and the donors, the role of the private sector. How can the private sector be brought to the table as a as a as a third party to kind of neutralize uh, uh, the debate? We should not have Pakistan and the donors talking at each other, but with each other, uh, and bringing in the private sector for for much needed oxygen. Over to you, Harun Saab. Gee, thank you very much, Amara. I think uh, uh, a lot has been said, and very rightly so. Uh, I will try to be very specifically addressing this issue which you have highlighted. First, we need to understand the nature of debt instruments which state deals with. So when, once you float a scoop or a bond, so the incentive for any finance minister or ministry is that that money gets into the pool of the budget uh, you know, resources. So uh, uh, that is fungible. And that can be, you know, raised uh, from markets, from multilaterals. So what we call, you know, the instruments of program support or budget support. And that's what Minister Rahman mentioned that Pakistan floated something, but the money was uh, part of the bigger pool. Uh, we also have instruments which are sector specific, like the VAPTA bonds, okay, which are linked to particular energy need of a country. But again, both these instruments are issued on the government sovereign guarantee, okay? And once these are issued on a guarantee that is part of the government's debt burden, okay? all right? And that is where Pakistan does not afford to carry on further in future. Now, the third instrument which we are trying to advocate and which many countries have done, by the way, I was just looking at numbers in the mark bond market. Bond market for climate resilience is likely to touch $5 trillion. I, I repeat, $5 trillion by 2025. Then I looked at that who is taking it. So 75% of the money is taken by the US, Japan, Germany, and UK and few European countries. So what it tells us is that the developing countries are not really ready to reach out to the global capital markets because of multiple factors. There's risk perception. There is what minister mentioned, the capacity issues. Uh, there are issues basically to structure transactions. Now, this, this context, let me now narrow down to Pakistan. Now, in Pakistan, I do not see uh, 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 a fiscal space emerging out of the government kitty for at least a couple of years. And that I'm very clear. There will be a resistance from government to issue more sovereign debt, which was indicated here. Now that's another reality. So what we need to basically look at is that, and I support Radhika's comment, it is Pakistan's problem. And we need to reach out to domestic resources, uh, you know, first, to demonstrate that you know we own the issue rather than just keep on looking external inflows you know in this particular area so my suggestions are that i think we need to think a little bit pragmatically uh, differently to this issue uh, we need when one when the minister mentioned the capacity issue all of us know that the state capacity is limited but my point is, if we start organizing the demand side, and let me explain what I mean by that. What are the, the money is with the institutional investors, be it domestic or regional or global. Hmm. Now, what they are looking at three specific things. Number one, uh, what is the governance structure which will oversee that money? We have touched transparency and other issues. But the solution is not state ministries. Let me repeat, a fund in the ministry will not attract private capital. But basically, if we create a corporate-like structure where you know, professionals manage it, so the arm's length, 
that has worked, which gives confidence to investors. That's number one. Number two challenge, as a matter of fact, in the, in the government is a change of mindset. Government uh, is so used to taking cheaper debt or floating a plain vanilla bond or using taxpayers' money. Now the times have changed. So I think that mindset part, ministry has to work on, we cannot but we can help them develop a better governance structure. Now there are three partners in this game. One is the state, which wants to you know, do this public good thing and financing. Second are development partners who provide the technical inputs and some provide financing as well. Third is private sector. Uh, still all three do not speak each other's language. Let me be very clear. So we need to understand each other better and start engaging better to understand what are the incentives which are driving each of this player to take this agenda forward. Now, my suggestion, I wish that, you know, a uh, 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 minister was here. I think Pakistan should not look at a very large intervention. Uh, the best way to build capacity is structured transactions. When you structure transactions, people learn. People learn, we learn lessons. There, are fail there will be failures, there will be successes, but that is where the confidence will build that you can do it. Otherwise, I'm afraid it will be remain a process, it will remain a talk, and my suggested entry points are twofold, which were indicated. Number one is a transaction about arranging financing for solar energy. This country is ripe for that. And we can very easily, I can, you know, on my estimates, we can raise an initial 100 to 200 million capital from Pakistan capital markets and financial institutions to start with. And once we have a portfolio, then we leverage from international sources. The second entry is I was just recently last week, the keynote speaker in Pakistan auto show. Uh, there is a lot of innovation happening in the private sector. The first you know, three wheeler electric vehicle has been developed in Pakistan without any external help, which will be launched in December. And they are looking for a very meager $30 million you know, financing uh, to scale that uh, this pilot up. You know. So what we need to look at is the second entry point is the low carbon emission transport sector. So if we just focus on these two, and in one year, if we could do some transactions done, the markets will get confidence. We will have a portfolio which will start servicing that you know, financing on its own, the sustainable financing. Then the final point comes that how do you make that financing cheaper? Financing globally is getting very expensive these days. Now, in order to make it cheaper, what comes up is that your ability to demonstrate impact. And that is a gap in the governments and in even the donor community that how do you actually calculate impact of that financing? And that is where investment is needed because that impact will bring the cost of financing down in the whole responsible finance market because they will gain otherwise. And that's where state will need to, if there's a good impact, then state needs to create fiscal incentives for that particular instrument. Now that is a model which I'm saying, my, my advice is that Pakistan should start very small, even $100 million equivalent, that people can raise within Pakistan set up two priority sectors. It's all very good to have a national climate agenda and a national fund, but looking at the politics in Pakistan and political economy and capability, I think it's a little medium to longer term aspiration and we should do that. But at this point, we need to demonstrate that we are serious about climate finance. We have the capability in private sector to innovate and take it forward. Donors are ready to provide technical assistance to structure deals. And then we reach out to the financial uh, institutions and capital market to fund it. And once we fund it, then you do the road show that guys, we have 100 million, we have sporting assets which are performing and please leverage it. Sorry, it's a little longer answer, 
but that's the approach I would, you know, uh, uh, strongly, uh, what I would say, advocate uh, uh, to the state. At times, we get really excited about very large scale transformational words and interventions without looking at the capability to structure, capability to absorb. Supply side is least of my actually problem at this point. We always keep on saying that increase the supply of money. My issue is organizing the demand and reaching out and tapping to supply in a manner which creates confidence and trust. This is my, uh, 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 whatever I have learned in this area so far. Thank, thank you, Haroon, for passionate and provocative, uh, you know, advisory. And let me just uh, highlight that Honorable Minister is very much online uh, with us. Uh, she's listening to all of you, Haroon Saab. She's listened to your uh, uh, prescription Wonderful. also. And we're very honored. And the Honorable Minister is most welcome to intervene if she so desires uh, as response. I see Sobia Becker wants to... Uh, possibly respond to Harun or any of the comments he's made? So uh, well, just to add to that, and I'm uh, really sorry, but um, the points that Harun just made are very important. And unfortunately, I have to peel off for another presentation, but I just wanted to raise this issue. First of all, the potential for solar investments in this country is massive, but the regulatory framework needs to be right. And here I talk about tariffs and pricing, and this is why in the beginning of my talk, I had alluded to a whole of government cohesive approach to addressing it, because still the regulatory and legislative framework is aligned, you cannot uh, ratchet up investments. Um, with respect to green bonds, there's uh, green sustainability linked bonds, social bonds, uh, blue bonds, there's tremendous potential for that. And to ready itself, what Pakistan can do is to develop a national taxonomy for such interventions, establish standards that will generate investor confidence and attract capital. So for example, uh, the EU has published its uh, action for um, uh, sustainable plan of action for growth. Uh, it has published standards for green bonds. These are things that Pakistan can certainly learn from and leverage. There is now a tremendous uh, thrust for environmental, social, and governance metrics and investing in projects which have very good uh, outcomes for these metrics. So there's a lot of captive private capital that is waiting there to be leveraged. And what is the biggest advantage with this capital? It's patient capital. This is, these are investors who are willing to wait for a longer time horizon for returns. And these time horizons match those of climate action. They match those of the SDG goals, et cetera. So it's very important to start these kind of debates, involve the financial sector authorities, involve the relevant ministries in getting this done. So I'm also reminded of the UNDP's DSDG investment platform. And uh, that is again, a fantastic initiative. But to date, there's only one high level mapping of eligible project categories uh, for the UN SDGs. And this was done by the International Capital Market Association. There are no specific principles. So, you know, this is just to identify another gap between development needs and directing private sector financial flows into the market and ensuring a certain effectiveness to its delivery. And I think that these are very um, pressing conversations that we need to have in order to uh, keep pace with the, with the level of, uh, of climate change that we're seeing, with the rate of climate change that we're seeing in this country. Otherwise, uh, things will get very, very difficult. So um, I'll stop there and my thanks to you and also congratulations to you and your team for this uh, fabulous webinar. I'm very sorry I have to run, but I look forward to keeping up with this conversation. Thank you to everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, Sobia. Thank you as always for your fantastic team spirit and very, very valuable uh, content. Uh, my, I think we, we have to be mindful of the time. I just want to kind of put a couple of points 
uh, as Sobia has left uh, uh, a couple of points for both Harun Saab and Radhika Saab and colleagues. We have a fantastic participation from uh, 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 people who are looking, who are watching this webinar, uh, about 100 of them, and they have also put in a lot of uh, questions in the chat box. I just, you know, Sobia's last point on there being several patient capitalists and patient investors who are willing to play the long game. Harun sir, probably we need to convene a, a, a conference of those patient capitalists as, as a first major event of the SDG investment facility. That's a very interesting question from one of the participants. Why are we only focusing on bond market why can't we use the other financial instruments like the one in India, uh, which is called Perform, Achieve and Trade, used to reduce energy usage and encourage the adoption of energy efficiency policy, and then e-certificate is being um, issued. This could be started on a smaller level and what could also involve the private sector. Very interesting question. And I'm just using now this as a final round of responses from Radhika and Harun before I turn to Kunut for his closing remarks. Radhika, would you like to respond to this first? Very interesting example from India. Yeah. Thanks, Samara. I, I don't know. I don't know the particular example. Um, but I think it's very much in the spirit of what both um, Harun and I have been saying, which is that we need to almost, if you like, have three tracks, right? And the government is absolutely right to look at, um, you know, at, at the global community and, you know, to, to look at international uh, access to international um, capital, which should be a lot easier than it is through the vertical funds. Um, you know, for priority countries like Pakistan uh, and other types of, um, you know, co-convening, organizing, bringing together of different funding mechanisms. But I think what we've been saying is there are also a whole range of other things that need to be done, private sector to private sector, the use of blended finance, where it, the focus is really on policy, of government getting the policy and the enabling environment right. Uh, to allow for all these different experiments, opportunities to flourish. So, you know, just the, the point that um, Harun Sahib was making, we're not going to necessarily um, get solar investment. Sorry, Sobia was making, we're not necessarily going to get those investments in, in solar if we don't have the right uh, regulatory environment, the, the right tariff structures. Um, EVs, if we can't bring down the upfront cost of capital, think about leasing, um, other schemes which will make it easier, you know, conversion kits, the whole range of uh, options to make it easier to transition. Um, but I think the whole focus needs to be on really allowing, providing that environment for these different experimentation, if you like, to try out these different instruments which don't add to the government's debt. Um, and where there is really a focus on problem solving and acceleration. So yeah, very much um, echo the, the, the sentiment that's been expressed of really thinking about a range of different options to, to really engage. Um, and on patient capital, I think that's one of the, uh, if I may come in on that, um, with many of the thematic bonds, there is no upfront benefit, right? Because the, the, the main risks are the same, which is really the risk of default and other things uh, compared to a vanilla bond. But what it does do is help diversify the pool of investors. So if you look at the experience again of um, Indonesia, when they started off with the green sukuks in 2018, um, you could say the so-called green investors, um, institutional otherwise, was perhaps about 27% of the total, you know, a variety of other, uh, other investors. Uh, four years down the line, it's, you know, it's more than half. So in four years, they really increased the investors who are looking explicitly for green. And in that time frame, we don't, we can't say for sure if it's because they're more patient and there's a higher number and they're willing to take a, you know, a, a lower rate, but the, the interest um, premium has come down. Um, and Indonesia issued the first ever 50 year green scope, i.e. much longer tenor with a much better price. 
So, you know, they must be doing something right at that level to be able to, to do that. And I think that's what we're talking about. So no immediate upfront benefits, but really courting this diversified pool of investors who then over time give Pakistan the, the space that it needs to really accelerate uh, on those investments. Um, and the last point I think one should just perhaps mention is that crisis can be the, the mother, the father, the child of uh, invention. And a lot of things that were, if you look at electronic banking, it wasn't invented in, you know, in the US or elsewhere. It came out of the experience of Brazil, where the currency was depreciating at such a rate, you simply couldn't keep up in real time. And they, they needed you know, electronic transactions. And it then took on a life of its own, and now we can't do without it. Um, and so the question is, you know, can we use the, the crisis to do some things differently, to shift that direction you know, in a way? So many countries in Asia Pacific um, and their colleagues uh, also here who can talk much more on that, simply cannot afford to maintain subsidies, right? And tax expenditures in favor of, of fossil fuels. I mean, even if there is a need to have you know, lower prices, government simply cannot afford to do it um, in many countries. Now the question is, as prices have come down, you know, the big question is, is there going to be a shift back to that? A shift towards allowing prices to dynamically adjust and then helping the poor make that transition while also making available alternatives in the EV and e-mobility, a broader e-mobility sector, or are we going to go back to, to business as usual? And I think those are some of the, the bigger questions that we should also look at uh, in this context. Thank you very much. Thank you, Radhika. Very pertinent solutions, examples, and a fantastic example from Brazil on how crisis led Brazil to uh, dabble, dabble with digital banking. Harun Saab, you get the last word from the panel uh, on, uh, you know, crisis and how we can leverage this for Pakistan. No, I think uh, very clearly that, you know, uh, uh, when there is a, a pressure, particularly fiscal pressure, it basically uh, pushes people to think differently because you need some solutions. Uh, I have seen some of the schemes which are coming in the questions. Uh, uh, that is where I said that you need a change of mindset where the state does not need to micromanage these interventions. We just need, and we have examples. Let me give you an example. About 15 years back or 17 years back, Pakistan reluctantly agreed to come up with a microfinance banks regulation. And now all these people, which were NGOs, they changed their governance structure. Just see how much leveraging for private capital they have received. Now they're even taking deposits from public. You know, you state needs to create incentives for people to respond. So these incentives for solar panels, electric vehicles, innovation, uh, it could be tax incentives, it could be cheaper financing, it could actually be, you know, even admissions to schools and things people have done it in universities, you know, for innovation. But these are the things where we need to create an ecosystem where people take it forward. I give you another example. You know, uh, in Pakistan's universities, I had recommended to Higher Education Commission that why don't you convert all universities to, you know, the solar uh, energy? Now that is, but they said, where would the money come from? I said, the solar provider would actually fund it, you know? But there was no framework overarching, actually letting the you know, state universities to do that. Because the structure is such that you are dependent on government grants. Now, some of these structures need to be challenged if we really want to excite the private sector to come into that. So my, my closing remarks are that, again, I would highlight that basically what sells is a, a, a small transaction, which has a potential to grow and which gives confidence to people. I 100% support that Pakistan should not go about borrowing expensive money uh, uh, and you know putting it in this sector. 
we need a combination of interventions, but I would leave this bigger question to everybody. Who will do that? We need to think very carefully. Who has the capability to do that? If we keep on repeating the same, looking up to state for doing it for us, I think uh, we, are, we will be committing the same mistake. It has to be all three stakeholders doing it. And the role UNDP and international players can play is effectively uh, creating a convening space where they can talk and learn and take it forward. I don't think any one actor, be it state or private sector or international uh, uh, financing or you know, institutions can do it by themselves. So I would suggest that let's take that approach. And in Pakistan, hopefully in six months time when we'll be speaking, we can showcase that here are the three instruments which are being done. Please tell us how can we improve it or how can we leverage it to take it forward? And I think that's what would be the real contribution to this cause uh, because awareness is there, willingness is there, capability is not there, supply of money is there, demand needs to be organized. And thank you with these words. Thank you, thank you, Harun. I think uh, your word, the, terming this as a as a cause, really is the answer. And uh, UNDP, in its next country program document for Pakistan, uh, iterates that we don't just need a whole of government approach. We actually need a whole of society approach. A whole of society approach everyone the public the government the private sector the development partners the people they all have a role to play uh, with this i request a resident representative UNDP Pakistan uh, Mr. Kunut Osby for his closing remarks thank you very much I, I will not uh, uh, keep you long with uh, just saying a, a few words uh, but let me let me uh, just uh, add some some thoughts one one, I think, is the, uh, the big issue for how we make development happen in the world. And uh, this was discussed at some great length when these SDGs were designed in uh, the 2015 and before 2015. There was a long and very inclusive discussion. One discussion, and climate change is a, is a big part of the SDGs. The, uh, there was a discussion about financing. And uh, I remember Jeffrey Sachs was commenting on the this is a uh, there's a need for a move from billions to to trillions, and we have been talking about trillions today. Um, but it's not only the the, the financing. It, so so but to to cover this financing, it is not enough to go with the traditional development assistance or with the traditional yeah. government budgets covering everything there will be a, a very important role for the private sector and also to make things happen. There is a need for everyone at, uh, at all levels to, to make a, a contribution. We do see, as we have, have commented on today, that uh, there is actually a sign that there are signs that, uh, or big signs that private sector is stepping up and becoming more interested in impact investment. And there is also from states and from organizations like ours, there is a, is a big shift towards paying more attention and focusing more on, uh, on uh, financing with impact and also uh, on, on climate change. Um, the minister, I, I noted, made the, the, the very uh, fair point that uh, Pakistan is uh, dealing with impacts of climate change created by somebody else. And that is a, is a big question for Pakistan, but as also the, the minister said, it does not take away the need for Pakistan to act on, on these issues. Uh, she talked about carbon markets, she talked about a number of different types of financing options, and she also outlined a little bit about the uh, size of needs uh, and the uh, promises that need to be fulfilled, both, both international promises that has been large financing promises made by developed countries and, and also Pakistan's own, own nationally determined contributions. <clears throat> there were a number of interventions on, uh, uh, on a wide range of issues. Uh, we talked 
uh, about, for example, uh, the fact that there are such a wide variety of instruments. We heard very useful examples from other countries. We talked about the need for experimentation and innovation, but also for scaling up. And I think the uh, um, one issue that was brought up by a number of people was the need for policies to make it possible for all these actors to, to play a role when they, when they want to. Uh, uh, they, um, uh, that brings me into maybe uh, recalling a few things that Harun Sharif has uh, outlined to us. He, he did make this point that uh, there is an interest in, in financing, but the policies will need to give a space for those who have, will have to facilitate the possibility for the private sector to, to play a role. Um, he talked about the, the price of finance and also um, made the point that also was made by others that there is a strong interest among in the financial sector about more and more interest in impact investment. And it's to a large extent a, a question of structuring the demand, structuring the ask such that uh, it can be picked up. And this is where uh, uh, we have tried more and more to advocate and also take very direct action towards uh, trying to, to make something happen. And, and we, uh, we think that this is uh, at least one important step that needs to be made is that to take some of the many good ideas coming from Pakistan and uh, formulate them and structure them in a way that it's possible for uh, impact uh, invested interested in impact in impact investment both domestic and international to pick them up and go uh, go into financing them and uh, because we cannot expect that uh, most of these investors go into detailed technical formulation for this there needs to be ideas structured in a way that they as uh, financiers can pick it up but I think there is a plethora of ideas there is a lot of enthusiasm shown today and also other in other contexts where I see this discussed. I think together we will make this happen. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Kanot, for your leadership uh, to uh, on the financing for development and climate financing portfolio for the UNDP team and for your excellent summation of, of today's discussion, I, I, I want to thank ladies and gentlemen, our, our esteemed speakers who really made this uh, a very enriching and educational experience for all of us. Mr. Kunot Osby, resident representative UNDP Pakistan, and we were very honored by the Federal Minister for Climate Change, Senator Sherry Rahman, who from her very busy schedule, I know, she took time out and uh, really put uh, a very clear policy, uh, you know, uh, framework for, for all of us to work on. I want to thank our, our brilliant panelists, Mr. Harun Sharif, UNDP's uh, Senior Financing for Development Advisor and former State Minister Chairman Board of Investment, Ms. Radhika Lal, UNDP Asia Pacific's SDG Finance Policy Advisor at the Bangkok Asia Hub, and Ms. Sobia Becker, uh, FCDO's Senior Climate Change Advisor and Team Lead at the British High Commission. Ladies and gentlemen, we hope you found this, uh, this webinar useful uh, for your respective work, and we look forward to a continu continuation of lots of more um, uh, good discussions on financing for development, including uh, climate financing. I want to thank our participants and our audience who tuned in and put in excellent uh, questions uh, for discussion. Thank you very much for your continued interest and until next time, have a good day. And thank you very much for excellent moderation. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you.